Joining us from the US is The Spectator's Washington editor, Amber Duke. Amber, thank you so much for joining us. Before we get into it, I have to get your take on the vice president's recent attack on Donald Trump today, which left-wing media outlets are just loving, connecting Donald Trump to Hitler. What do you make of it? Well, it's a disgusting attempt at a character assassination, and I think it shows you how desperate the Kamala Harris campaign is because over the past few weeks, the slight advantage she enjoyed in the polls has completely evaporated. Real Clear Politics has Trump leading in every single swing state, and you can basically count mm -hmm. on if Trump is ahead by one or two points, he's probably up by four or five based on polling bias. And she's running this message based off of an Atlantic article that is full of shoddy reporting where every single on the record source except for one has said that Trump never made any comments like the ones that are reported by Jeffrey Goldberg. Um, so she's lashing out because I think she knows she's losing. Yeah, and that's a detail she just doesn't want to admit that uh, it's already been debunked. But as you, you mentioned the polls, so let's take a look at them. For the first time since August, Donald Trump has overtaken Kamala Harris in the Economist's prediction model for the US presidential election. And the latest forecast gives Donald Trump a 54% chance of returning to the White House. That is up six points in the past week. Let's look at the betting market. The betting odds for Donald Trump winning the election have hit their highest since July. That was when President Biden stepped aside for Kamala Harris. And on polling market, Donald Trump leads Kamala Harris by more than 25%. That is a significant number, Amber. Why are we seeing this? It is significant. I think what you're seeing is the Harris honeymoon is over. And Trump's pollsters predicted this back when she first took over the nomination from Joe Biden. Democrats were just excited that they didn't have to vote for and effectively a corpse anymore, right? They had a living, breathing human being who was seemingly capable of walking onto a stage and reading remarks from a teleprompter without repeating the line. Um, and unfortunately for them, they found out that Kamala Harris is just as vapid as Joe Biden. She, to this day, has failed to explain why her positions changed so much between 2019 and 2024. She has refused to even answer on what some of her positions are, most notably in this latest NBC News interview, refusing to say whether or not she supports taxpayer-funded sex changes for illegal aliens who are in prisons, which is like the most insane Mad Lib that you can come up with. And yet somehow this is a debate for Kamala Harris as to whether to say yes or no to this policy. So every part of her campaign has demonstrated that she's not prepared to lead. That's why the polls are shaking out the way they are today. And Americans are voting in historic numbers ahead of Election Day. That includes Republicans, as many seem to be responding to a new message from uh, former President Donald Trump, telling them that it's OK to vote early. In Nevada, more Republicans have reportedly submitted ballots than Democrats for the first time in a presidential election year since 2008. What do you make of the trends? In, in Nevada, that includes Clark County, which is obviously where Las Vegas is, which is going to be a huge player in that swing state. And then Republicans also doing really well with early voting in Virginia, which most people would assume is going blue. But uh, the Trump team seems to think that that's in play as well because of the early vote returns. And clearly the Trump campaign's messaging on this, as well as the Republican National Committee's attempt to get people to vote early is paying off. They've invested a lot of money in making sure that when they are knocking on doors or otherwise reaching voters, that they are giving them their options for how they can vote ahead of Election Day. And this is really important because when you're running a political campaign, you want to be able to narrow your focus on a select few voters voters that you think are going to turn the election in these final few weeks, if you have a voter who banks their vote early or does a mail-in or absentee ballot, that's one less person that you have to spend money courting and one less person whose door you have to knock again or who, who you have to worry about reaching in a television ad. So it makes their job a lot easier in that final stretch. Kamala Harris is continuing her media campaign. She should probably just stop. But this was the exchange with NBC News journalist Hallie Jackson about what Kamala Harris's position is on gender-affirming care. Do you believe that transgender Americans should have access to gender-affirming care in this country? I believe we should follow the law. 
I mean, I think you're probably pointing to the fact that Donald Trump's campaign has spent tens of millions of dollars. They're trying to define in, you on this. Yes. I'm asking yeah. you to define yourself, though. Just broadly speaking, I what just, is your value? My, Do you believe they should have that access? I believe that, that people, as the law states, even on this issue about federal law, that that is a decision that doctors will make in terms of what is medically necessary. I'm not going to put myself in the position of a doctor. The journalist noticed that Kamala Harris did not answer the question, so she tried again. It feels like that's a it's long way from we see you and we love you, which was your message to trans Americans in May. What do, you, what do you want the LGBTQ plus community to know as they're looking for a full throated backing from you for trans for trans Americans? I believe that all people should be treated with dignity and respect. Period. And should not be vilified for who they are and should not be bullied for who they are. And that is a, a true statement for me my entire career. And that has not changed. Amber, why can't Kamala Harris be clear on this? It is an issue that is front of mind for voters, for parents, especially when you look at Tim Waltz and his history of making it law that minors can access gender-affirming care in Minnesota. Why is Kamala Harris being so vague about it now? She recognizes that she is stuck between a hard, rock and a hard place because the Democrat progressive base believes strongly in this issue. They feel like transgender Americans are allegedly under attack and need to have the full support of their politicians in order to access health care, as they put it. But on the other side, she has swing voters and independents who, when surveyed, say that they think uh, allowing boys to play in girls' sports or use their locker rooms or their bathrooms or, God forbid, allowing taxpayers to pay for surgeries is something that is completely out of pocket. And so she's trying to cobble together these two coalitions that are fundamentally uh, diametrically opposed to one another and, frankly, can't coexist on policy issues. And you'll notice there that Hallie Jackson asked her, uh, about this question, and, and Kamala Harris responded by saying, well, I would support the law. The entire point is that she could potentially be president. She would have the power to change a law that she doesn't like by pushing it through Congress and signing a bill that lands on her desk. Yeah, it's it's not really an answer to a question. It's outrageous for people listening. Now, Democratic vice presidential candidate Tim Waltz appeared on The View this week, and he was questioned about some of his false statements. Can't there be no gray area? And how would you convey to voters they may be concerned that there's a trust issue? Yeah, I do think you have to be careful about this. It's stating, you know, in Hong Kong in August of 89, 35 years ago, I think people do separate that between a pathological liar like Donald Trump. They get it out there. <laughs> but I do think it's important that we're, we're careful about how we speak. It's something for me is, I think, being a teacher, being a coach, I, I just speak from my heart. I speak honestly. I speak in the moment. And in preparing for a debate, I told my team that one of the I felt like I'm at a disadvantage in a debate because my tendency is to just answer the question that you're asked. Amber, Tim Waltz has just been a disaster. Surely the Democrats really regret this pick. Yes, and that was the danger, of course, of replacing the nominee, is that you have a shorter vetting period for who you're going to pick as your running mate. Clearly, whoever was in charge of that did not do a very good job. It is interesting that Tim Walls brings up that phrase pathological liar, because I think the fundamental problem with his quote-unquote misstatements is that there's a pattern of them, right? It's not just one, but this happened on multiple occasions about several resume aspects of his life, whether it was his military service saying he carried weapons in war to misstating his rank to this day that he never earned in his military service from abandoning his uh, fellow service members on a deployment that he claimed he didn't know about. His supervisor says that was a lie. He claimed he was in Tiananmen Square, which he apparently was not. He even comes up with petty lies, like the idea that he doesn't season his tacos. Uh, so uh, up and down his entire history, he's been telling these little fibs that's the definition of pathological. Yeah, and but he liked to bring up Donald Trump and take aim at him. Uh, meanwhile, he is the pathological liar. Now, Amber, I have to get your thoughts on Donald Trump's uh, campaign tactic that we saw this week. I thought it was brilliant where, that when he was uh, manning the fry station at a drive through McDonald's. Here's a little clip of it. I'm looking for a job, and I've always wanted to work at McDonald's, but I never did. I'm running against somebody that said she did, but it turned out to be a totally phony story. So, President Trump! Well, that's a good-looking group. Hello, everybody. 
I'm having a lot of fun here, everybody. I'm going to take care of it. And Bob, what did you make of it? I thought it was a brilliant campaign move. He really accomplished two things here. The first is that Trump has always been a great retail politician. He is at his best when he is around normal Americans, just talking and interacting with them. It's very authentic. He doesn't pretend to be somebody that he's not. He's still wearing his classic uh, uh, button-down shirt and his red tie, but he takes the job seriously and he treats everybody around him with respect. So he gets to show off that side of him while at the same time playing into what his campaign has been trying to define Kamala as, which is a phony, because there are serious questions about whether or not she actually worked at McDonald's. She has said on past applications where she's supposed to list every job, she doesn't list McDonald's. She hasn't pulled up uh, an easy way to prove it, which is she could pull up her IRS you know, tax records. She mm -hmm. could pull up her social security records. She's refused to do that. So I think really the burden is on her. If she's going to tout her uh, McDonald's service as part of her middle-class bona fides, then she needs to produce the evidence. Amber Duke, Washington editor at The Spectator. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. We really appreciate it. Thanks, Gabriella.